Thank you. Thank you. Clerk, please introduce item 333. Yes, item 333, Moussa et al. and San Diegans for Open Government, SDOG, Litigation Settlement Implementation. Uh, we do have a number of public speakers, so folks, if you're here to speak on 333, it'll be two minutes per speaker. Good afternoon. How much time would you need for your presentation? Ten minutes, please. Ten minutes, okay. And please make sure to introduce yourself for the record. Good afternoon, Honorable Council President Gomez and members of the City Council. I'm Mike Hansen, uh, the Director of the City's Planning Department. With me is Elise Lowe, Development Services Director. And the Planning Department is the lead department on this item due to the Community Plan Amendment, Rezone, and Land Development Code changes that are proposed. So we're here before you today to request that the council approve several agreements, planning documents, and code amendments to implement the terms of two settlement agreements approved by the city council. These settlement agreements relate to two cases filed against both the city and Civic San Diego. One filed by Murda Zabaxmuza and the San Diego County Building and Construction Trades, and the second filed by San Diegans for Open Government. On the whole, these changes return the planning, permitting, and parking functions from Civic San Diego to the city and preserve Civic San Diego as a private, nonprofit organization focused on community development and investment. These changes will increase certainty of process for projects downtown and enhance consistency of regulations across the city. By way of background, the city first delegated the planning and permitting functions to, uh, down, in downtown in 1992 to the Center City Development Corporation. CCDC continued to perform these services until 2012 when redevelopment agencies were dissolved by the state of California. In that same year, Civic became the successor to CCDC for the development functions downtown. The Baxamusa lawsuit was filed in 2015 and um, in 2017, the city council in closed session directed staff as well as the city attorney's office to attempt to settle the case. In February of 2018, SDOG, or San Diegans for Open Government, filed a lawsuit against the city and Civic San Diego on similar claims. Settlement negotiations proceeded during most of 2018. And in March of this year, City Council approved the settlement of both cases in closed session. Implementation of the terms of the settlement agreements requires several actions by the City Council, which I'll walk through. Next slide, please. The relationship between the City and Civic is currently governed by two agreements, an agency agreement and an operating agreement. The agency agreement is proposed to be terminated because with the return of planning and permitting functions, it is no longer needed. The operating agreement will be amended to transfer the planning, permitting, and parking functions from Civic to the city for the downtown area. This means that the only surviving contractual relationship between the city and Civic and the operating agreement will be for Civic to perform consulting services to support the city relating to former redevelopment activities. And this will occur for a term of five years with one five-year extension as an option with the vote of the City Council. After the operating agreement term ends, there will be no longer a contractual relationship between the City and Civic San Diego. Revisions to the Civic Articles of Incorporation and bylaws are also proposed. And this would remove the City as the sole member of, Civic, of the Civic Corporation making Civic a completely independent and separate entity from the city. The bylaws are also amended to revise the purpose of the Civic Corporation, primarily to provide community development and community investment services. Revisions to the city's municipal code are also proposed. Currently, downtown has three different planned district ordinances, or PDOs, 
one for the gas lamp, one for the marina district, and one for Center City, which covers the rest of downtown outside of gas lamp and marina. The code amendments proposed would remove all references to Civic San Diego, and it would update the land use approval process for downtown. And this would mean that the city would issue development permits downtown, not Civic San Diego, as, as is currently the case. The review process would also be amended to elim eliminate two permit types which currently exist only downtown, and the code amendments would bring the downtown permit process into conformance with the citywide process, process one through five, and uh, without elevating any permit level to a higher process. The marina plan district ordinance would be repealed, and the marina neighborhood would be subject to the center city PDO. Because of the repeal of the marina PDO, the downtown community plan and the local coastal program uh, would both need an amendment. Uh, the amendment would remove the reference to the marina district boundaries from the, from the maps and the plan and add the specific land use districts, floor area ratios, and heights from the center city PDO. This is being done for consistency purposes, essentially, so uh, to improve uh, the, the clarity of what the regulations are. However, it does not change any of the land uses, densities, or intensities in the marina district. So similarly, along with the PDO repeal and the, and the downtown community plan amendment, for consistency purposes, the marina neighborhood will also be rezoned to the center city PDO zones. And this means that the center city PDO zones uh, will ap apply in the marina area and the same uses would apply. It would not increase the density or intensity. And uh, along the same lines, the marina, uh, Urban, the Marina Urban Design Guidelines would also be repealed and replaced with the Downtown Design Guidelines, which are uh, much more current and reflective of um, current best practices in urban design. So looking forward, the City Council, uh, if the City Council adopts the proposed item, the ordinance would take effect 30 days after the second after the mayor signs the ordinances after the second reading. So, for example, uh, if the second reading occurs on June 18th and the mayor signs on June 20th, the new ordinances and plan and rezone would take effect on July 20th. In addition, a small portion of downtown is part of the coastal zone. So the ordinances rezone and plan amendment would not take effect in that portion of downtown until the Coastal Commission certifies the changes. Also, the proposed FY 2020 budget includes positions necessary to transfer the planning, permitting, and parking functions over to the city and ensure a smooth transition of, of all of those functions to the city. So we recommend that the council approve the proposed actions in the staff report and we're available for any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. And before we take up public testimony, the city attorney has some comments. Uh, yes, we just wanted to make a correction. Uh, for clarification, the new operating agreement before you in sub item A is only a five year agreement. Any extension must be approved by the council. Therefore, it is not a six vote under Charter Section 99, in light of this, the ordinance approving the operating agreement will be amended by interlineation to delete the eighth recital clause, and only five votes are needed to pass the item. Thank you. Thank you. We will now take up public testimony. Claire, please proceed. Yes, and again, uh, due to the number of speakers, folks will have two minutes apiece. We'll begin with our opposition speakers. Joyce Summers, is our first speaker. She'll be followed by Gary Smith. After our two opposition speakers, we'll turn to the in favor group, beginning with Maddie Kilkenny. And if Ms. Kilkenny can be in the front row ready to go, that helps with meeting management. So Ms. Summer, please come forward. You'll have two minutes, followed by Gary Smith. Good afternoon, President. Uh, Gomez, council members. My name is Joyce Summer. I reside at 850 Beach Street, and I've been a resident downtown for 26 years. I've, um, since Wyatt Earp patrolled the gas lamp, actually, I, I helped form the downtown planning group in 2001, chaired it for seven years, and 
subsequently handled outreach for CCDC for three or four more years. For those of you too young to remember, that's what Civic used to be called, CCDC. I still speak before them on some issues. So I know that organization, and by and large, it's done a really good job. I understand that what's going to happen today has to be, but I do have some concerns. Number one, I want to be sure that the city understands that downtown is the engine that drives the regional economy. It's important and needs to be treated as such. As important as it is, however, it's still a neighborhood, eight of them. We want to continue to have a voice in approving CUPs and NUPs, and that proper rules and regulations are in place. We don't want rooftop entertainment all over. Excuse me for kind of reading it, but I wrote it quickly this morning. <laughs> of course, we want to be sure that proposed projects continue to come before the downtown planning group and that you listen to its comments and recommendations. Parking District 1 and the DPMG have done a wonderful job over the years managing downtown's 45% share of parking meter revenue. We will be watching you carefully to make sure that this continues. And finally, CCDC and Civic have done a pretty good job at moving projects through the pipeline. So it's only cost developers an arm instead of an arm and a leg to get good projects through. We'd like to be sure that the city moves just as quickly, maybe even faster, maybe as fast as Wyatt Earp's gun. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Gary Smith is our next speaker. Then we'll turn to our in favor speakers, beginning with Maddie Kelkenny, followed by Rick Bates. Good afternoon, Council President Gomez, Council Members, Gary Smith, President of the San Diego Downtown Residents Group. I would have thought that we could have written a new agreement that would address all the concerns that was there, but if this is the route you're all choosing to go town, that's why we vote for you to make decisions. This organization, which has basically more than doubled the population of downtown, which has made downtown one of the jewels that sits here along the coast. It's going to be sad to see it go. We have, as a result of their efforts, almost 20% of downtown is affordable housing. Percentage-wise, I think that's probably greater than any other community. We also have over 900 permanent supportive housing units. That is greater than the total in the whole rest of the city. This is a whole community. We do whole things. And there are things that you may not know about that are important to us. Our community plan lays out a plan for parks. Most of this was wasteland, if you remember, parking lots and warehouses back in the day, and it's not. We're getting more residents, and we need those parks. We have mechanisms. We have FAR bonuses. We have TDR transfers. To most of you, that's just gobbledygook. To us, that is real dollars that go to purchase and develop our parks. Who's going to keep track of that? There's nothing in this new set of ordinances that allows us to figure out who in the city to go and talk to and say, how much money is accumulated? When can we spend it? Who's working on the property procurement? All those different types of things. I'm sure that we'll figure it out as we go along. I'm sure that we'll get, get intimately acquainted with Park and Rec and the city's real estate department. But this is not enough guidance. So I hope you'll pardon us coming back to you and asking for more in the future. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now turn to in favor speakers, Maddie Kilkenny. She'll have two minutes. She'll be followed by Rick Bates, followed by Kaylee Levy. Good afternoon, Council President Gomez and members of the council. My name is Maddie Kilkenny, and I was appointed to the Civic San Diego Board in 2016 by Mayor Faulkner. At this moment of transition, I think it's worth remembering the 45-year history of redevelopment in downtown San Diego. In the early 70s, downtown San Diego was the epitome of urban blight, so much so that the Hollywood film Hardcore about prostitution and pornography was filmed in our downtown. Our then mayor set out to identify the best model to manage the redevelopment of a declining downtown. The mayor and council decided to pursue an unusual model, a city-owned independent corporation in what we came to know as CCDC and now Civic San Diego. The independent corporation would be free from politics, governed by an independent board of professionals and community leaders, and staffed by committed experts. We were created to get things done well and get them done quickly. 
and I think we did that. Today, downtown San Diego is one of the most dynamic urban centers in the nation. It's attracted over $14 billion in private investment. More than 75,000 people work here, and more than 35,000 people live here. CCDC and Civic were instrumental in many things that San Diegans take for granted today. The preservation of Gaslamp Quarter's historic architecture, the reinvigoration of Little Italy, the development of the East Village, the creation of the ballpark. We partnered with the port to redo the Embarcadero and played a critical role in the creation of the Convention Center, touring and quiet zones, and we have funded more than 2,000 affordable homes and more than 150 homeless beds. We wrote the award-winning Downtown Mobility Plan, which has created a blueprint for protected bike lanes and greenways throughout downtown. However, I don't have to tell you there is so much more to do. San Diego is evolving. Homelessness, community character, fair and equitable housing solutions, and so many more issues still need attention and input. We place that burden and that hope back with you and the capable city staff. All of us who love San Diego owe a debt of gratitude to the 1975 mayor and council, its successors, the hundreds of volunteers who served on our board, and of course, the dedicated community members and professional staff who made it happen. I urge your support today. Thank you. Thank you. Rick Bates is our next speaker, followed by Kaylee Levy, followed by Stephen Russell. And Mr. Bates has time seated by Ryan Carlsgott. Thank you, Ryan. Yadira Ariano. Thank you. Maricela Gonzalez. Is Maricela here? Thank you. And Sandra Lomale, or Lomale. Thank you. So uh, you can have 10 minutes, sir. Uh, thank you. I'll probably only need like maybe four or five minutes. Um, good afternoon, by the way, uh, council members, council president Gomez and staff. My name is Rick Bates with Unite Here, Local 30, uh, the hotel workers union in San Diego. With more than 6,500 hotel workers, uh, I'm sorry, members, Local 30 is committed to, pr to promoting quality of life for hotel and hospitality workers, workers who make up the front line of a thriving economic engine, helping to make San Diego America's finest city. Regarding the matter of making San Diego America's finest city, this hearing is largely regarding the land use process therein, specifically the downtown area of San Diego, and the process by which land use decisions are made and ultimately who should make them. Hotel and hospitality workers generally and Local 30s members specifically have a great interest in these issues. Hotel and hospitality workers help drive the economy in the city of San Diego. Without hotel workers to operate the region's hotels during high-profile revenue-generating conventions, we would not have high-profile revenue-generating conventions. Save our moderate climate, it's the guest experience and efficiency of service received by conventioneers at these hotels that keeps San Diego competitive in the destination convention and business conference market. And it's not just the hotel workers that keep visitors coming back, it's also the hospitality and food service workers uh, at the San Diego International Airport who welcome the conventioneers as they fly into downtown. It's the hospitality and food service workers who work the actual conferences at the San Diego Convention Center downtown. And if a visitor wants to catch a ball game or an outdoor concert at Petco Park before they fly home, it's the hospitality and food service workers at Petco Park downtown that make sure these ball game and concert goers have their hot dogs and libations. These are our members. From, time, uh, from the time the conventioners and tourists arrive until the time that they depart and everywhere in between, these are our members. San Diegans who produce the experience needed for our hospitality industry to be the economic engine that it is and to aid in catalyzing further growth in other economic uh, sectors of the region as well. But these workers who mean so much to the city are not being served by many of the land use decisions that are being made. There's no question that Civic San Diego has done a remarkable job in building up the downtown area. But we look around and it's clear to see that downtown was not built with everyone in mind. Hotel workers are clearly needed to work here, but they can't afford to live here. From a taxpayer's perspective, this means that more public resources will have to go into the public infrastructures and services being stressed by the resulting increase of commuting workers. That stacked on top of the stress of thousands of workers, and I mean thousands, that are already coming into downtown every single day. The creation of housing affordable for working class families is not keeping up with the creation of new jobs that are ha happening downtown. From a hotel worker's individual perspective, this could mean losing upwards of three hours a day using public transit because the only housing that they can afford is in far off neighborhoods outside of these transit priority areas. Planning decisions have made a key role in creating this imbalance. In fact, some of the last buildings reserved for low and very low income residents have been converted 
into trendy boutique hotels. Indeed, projects that literally removed affordable housing options. Workers and their families deserve more, and the city's delegation of land use powers has only served as an obstacle towards the public's ability to meaningfully engage with their elected leaders. And even in the fewer instances where projects that began in Civic San Diego and then were later brought before the city council, those projects still lacked the public engagement process that would normally be available uh, when the city was the lead agency. For example, the Smart Growth and Land Use Committee, composed of a board of our elected officials, are not factored into civics land use process. Excuse me. Hotel and hospitality workers contribute greatly to the success of our downtown and regional economy. And we believe that their voices need to be heard in a meaningful way when land use decisions are made. Those decisions should be made not just for those with means, but for all San Diegans. So for those reasons, we respectfully ask that you approve the proposed actions to implement the terms of the Box Musa Settlement Agreement and bring the land use approval process back into conformance with the citywide land use approval process. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kaylee Levy. She'll have two minutes, and she will be followed by Stephen Russell, followed by Michael D. Jenkins. Good afternoon, Council President Gomez and Council members. My name is Kalei Levy, and I am here today on behalf of the Downtown San Diego Partnership in support of the revisions proposed to you today. Civic San Diego has been an integral part of ensuring a clear and expedited development process in downtown. In consideration of the changes proposed today, our members are interested in maintaining certainty and speed in the develop, development process, which includes retention of the program EIR, the community plan, and a design review process, retaining institutional knowledge of Civic San Diego staff, and ensuring continuity in the process for projects currently in the pipeline. Based on what we currently understand, we believe these needs have been met with the proposed changes. We will continue to be involved with the implementa implementation of these changes to ensure it unfolds as intended, and we look forward to seeing how this next iteration will continue to promote new projects in the community. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Stephen Russell is our next speaker. He'll be followed by Michael D. Jenkins. Oh, good afternoon, Honorable Council President and members of the City Council. My name is Stephen Russell. I'm a board member of Civic San Diego since 2017, and I'm pleased here today to uh, support the proposed implementation actions in front of you today and to mark a major transition in the life of our organization. In recent years, Civic San Diego has played an increasingly prominent role in the economic development of our neighborhoods. In particular, those communities which had previously benefited from redevelopment agent agency activities. These communities, which had previously been subjected to decades of institutionalized disinvestment, will remain a principal focus of Civic's activities moving forward. In recent years, Civic has, cha has channeled over $126 million in new market tax credit investments into these neighborhoods. These catalytic, catalytic investments include the Copley Price YMCA in City Heights and Talmadge, the Jackie Robinson y, YMCA in Southeast San Diego, and, uh, and uh, the Family Health Centers in Encanto, uh, Ajinomoto Foods in San Ysidro, and the Casa Familiar Project as well. We have served as a, folk, as, a, as a focal agent to support the Choyas Creek, I'm sorry, fiscal agent, to, my own handwriting here, as a fiscal agent to support the Choyas Creek restoration and other really significant community projects. These are examples of the kinds of projects and investments that Civic San Diego, reconstituted as a private nonprofit, will continue to pursue. I look forward to bringing my 10 years of experience on the board of the City Heights Community Development Corporation to bear on the activities of, of Civic. We are proud of our work in the past and enthusiastic about our role as a regional CDC in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Michael D. Jenkins is our next speaker. Mr. Jenkins, you'll have two minutes. Good afternoon. I've been a member of the board for six years, appointed by Mayor Filner, reappointed by Mayor Faulkner. Uh, and I'm here to support item 333. If approved, these actions will transfer civics downtown planning and related functions back to the city and moreover, we'll convert the nonprofit corporation from city ownership to an independent non-governmental status. The downtown planning function is one that I've been proud of. Um, it's uh, sometimes been controversial, but our, pro our decisions have always been transparent, 
They have been included uh, broad community input, and they have always been decided consistent with the downtown PDOs and other, other governing laws. Civic's loss of this function is the city's gain. Brad Richter and the staff members you are inheriting are true public servants. Regarding Civic San Diego's future as an independent structure, uh, we believe that in that structure, the corporation will have significant value to the people of our city. They fall into three categories based on what we do. First, the seemingly mundane but vital accounting and contracts management function includes ongoing uh, tracking and monitoring of hundreds and hundreds of contracts and financing obligations. Many of these relate to past redevelopment projects, but there are numerous other grant and contract and financing obligations currently being managed and will in the future. Second, the financing function at Civic has brought over, as, as Stephen said, over 100 million new dollars to San Diego that have benefited mostly community-based nonprofits. The new market tax credit program pays for itself and provides resources to other projects. Civic is poised to seek out other financing resources to further support our neighborhoods. And third, the public works function provides highly capable and professional construction management support for large capital improvement projects, always with broad community input. These three important functions will continue at Civic and I believe will expand to provide collaborative support to many community-based nonprofits. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. In addition, there were a number of speakers who submitted speaker slips in favor but did not wish to speak. They include Armando Nunez, Carol Kim, Tom Lemon, Gretchen Newsom, Stephen T. Cooper Smith, Philippa Grumbly, Doug Hicks, and uh, Chris Allen. And with that, that concludes the public testimony on this item. Thank you. We're going to start with Council Member Ward. Thank you, Council President, and I want to thank staff for all of your hard work. I know this was a long road and a, a huge heavy lift, and there's a lot of um, Im important consequence here for getting this right. And so the work that you've done and the focus effort that you had in this is certainly appreciated uh, representing downtown. We are excited for all the energy and the development, the hundreds of projects that have been able to transition through civics assistance, and the value that that's placed on the growth of the downtown community is awesome. But, uh, you know, with some of this transition happening, we want to look forward to this opportunity now to bring functions back into the city where we have a little bit more public accountability and oversight and opportunity to even further build on that and take downtown to the next level. Um, I wanted to ask just a couple of quick questions. Um, we have some very important projects currently in uh, process right now, the East Village Green, Children's Park, the 14th Street Gateway. How will those projects really continue unimpeded through this transition? So there is a category of projects that are called out in the operating agreement, including those that you mentioned, that will continue to be handled by Civic until they're completed. And the reason for that was to ensure that there's no disruption or additional cost or delay that would be imposed on those projects. Um, I don't believe there's any further specificity in the agreement on, on how, how those projects are handled after that. If there is decision-making necessary for amendments or subsequent actions that would probably come before the city, then that um, we would handle that at that time. If there's something that requires council action or another or an city change, I believe it would come to the city. And I'd invite um, someone from Civic to provide further clarity if there's something that I missed. Sure. Andrew Phillips, Interim President of Pacific San Diego. And yes, those projects would be managed through the new operating agreement. Um, and they would, any decision would be voted upon by this uh, council in terms of funding, in terms of priorities. And so we, as we have in the past, we'd always come in front of council seeking uh, approval of projects. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I'm going to ask a, a question related to what Joyce Summer had asked. I appreciate you being here, Joyce, and all, all the things you do for downtown. This came up as I was talking this morning with the Little Italy Association. The role of DCPC um, going forward, how would you characterize that as if they were any other community planning group, uh, the process that we know today? What will their involvement be in advisory and uh, role in decision making? DCPC will continue to provide an advisory role, just like every other planning group. The permit process will change, however, because those two downtown specific permit types will be eliminated. Currently, those permit types require a presentation at DCPC, and in going forward into the future, uh, whether DCPC notice is required is going to depend on what permit type is applied for. For example, if it's a ministerial permit, 
just like everywhere else in the city, notice would not be required to go to DCPC. Other than that, it will still provide the advisory function. Uh, we staff will recommend that developers provide a presentation, design review to DCPC, but it is changing slightly from the current process. Okay, good to know and to, to get on the record. And, and finally, to answer, um, uh, maybe respond to Gary Smith's question about uh, the ongoing responsibilities, accountability, who can the community contact to be able to continue to monitor any projects that kind of come within, uh, that are being facilitated through the city, you're creating the Smart and Sustainable Communities branch, and I wonder if you just wanted to take a second to, if I'm correct, to talk about what that is and, and sort of how we answer this question about who a good point of contact would be. Sure. So in the proposed budget, we have um, added, recommended adding uh, nine positions that would be a standalone division re reporting directly to the DCOO for S Smart Sustainable Committee Communities, Eric Caldwell. Uh, that division will have a manager. So there will be one point of contact uh, to go to. It, that really should not change compared to how it, it is currently operating in Civic San Diego. We, of course, hope that all of the same employees will come over to the city. We understand that most of them would like to come over. So even the same people that are interacting with the downtown community uh, should still be the go-to points of contact in the city structure as well. That's great news. So this will be as uh, hopefully seamless of a transition as possible. And I, again, appreciate all the hard work that you put into this to um, get us to the state. I'm looking forward uh, to helping in any way that I can if there's any hiccups along the way so that downtown planning and processing continues to be um, smooth and, uh, and uh, even better going forward. So thank you, Council President. Happy to make a motion for this item. Thank you. Council Member Sherman. Sure, I can speak now or when the, um, when the council members are done with their comment. <coughs> I'll just go ahead now. I understand our office uh, needs to make an additional correction to the ordinance pertaining to the operating agreement, so we can go ahead and make that correction now. Sure. Actually, the, uh, the additional correction is to, in the ordinance, part of the action today should be to authorize um, the city to enter into a sublease uh, with Civic for a certain office space within Civic's current offices for six, approximately six budgeted positions of people who won't, there is no city office space for them currently. So it simply authorizes the city um, to enter into a sublease for that space uh, for no longer than a year and for a dollar amount not to exceed $125,000. And it authoriz authorizes the CFO to um, take all necessary actions, set up the accounts to, to accomplish that. And we can interlineate accordingly. Okay. Oh, Council Member Sherman. Thank you. Uh, appreciate staff and the, and the presentation here. And um, I can't support today's measure. I mean, Civic was created originally to keep politics out of land use decisions. And now we're going to be voting to bring all this back into city processes and where politics kind of rears its head in just about every land use decision that is made. To me, that makes absolutely no sense at all. Um, we can tell by the people here supporting it that it, are wanting this to happen. They're all either political operatives or union operatives, which shows me that politics is involved in this decision from the very beginning and not common sense. So there's no way I can be supportive of today's measure and be voting no. Sorry worries um there i don't see anybody else in the lights i'll be happy to second the motion i'll be um, i can second the motion is fine and uh um before i go council uh, council member campbell thank you uh, we were both going to second the motion um i think it's a good idea to get it out of private hands i think the public good will be well served and we'll see who's right but thank you very much Thank you. Um, so thank you, Steph, for, for the work on uh, getting us here. I, I do believe this is the right um, course of action. Um, just from the beginning, I've never been a, a fan of having some significant land use decisions being managed by entities that are not um, public entity. Uh, politics are always going to be in the mix no matter what, but I, I do think that land use is one of the core issues that we're elected to 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 be responsible of. Um, and I think this is something that is pretty significant as we're taking 
downtown to the next phase uh, and definitely want to ensure that the transition is done the right way and if if possible if we can fold in the the current staff that understands the dynamics of, of what they've been managing i think that makes sense uh to that extent and definitely want to appreciate the work that um the current team has been doing on behalf of of the council um i want to appreciate the community for being here and i'm only hopeful that as we're looking at the future of downtown that we keep in mind the inclusiveness of what downtown should be. I think I was reminded by by the representative of Unite here that we have such a um, huge workforce, but that workforce cannot afford to live in downtown. So as we're attracting um, future housing, wanna make sure that we're being inclusive of that. So um, hopefully we can attract those developers to, to really be more inclusive. So with that, uh, please cast your vote. Clerk, please call the roll. And that passes five to two with Councilmember Kate and Councilmember Sherman voting no and Councilmember Montgomery and Councilmember Kersey absent. Thank you. Thank you all. Just, uh